thanks so much for coming, first of all. Um, it's great, great to have you here. Um, I will be tossing out some, uh, some general questions to get us started, and then I'll be opening this up to all of you. So if you have some questions, um, you'll hopefully get an opportunity to ask them. And if you don't, uh, you can always ask them if you, if you uh, join the signing line. So, um, Sarah Michael John um, is one of the heroes of, of your book, and she's uh, one, one of the first to kind of uh, crack the anonymity um, in the blockchain as, as an academic researcher. And, and you, you give um, her a, a kind of um, origin story to use uh, Mar Marvel Universe terminology. She, uh, she does puzzles on long car rides um, and she uh, becomes obsessed with the Rosetta Stone um, on a visit to, uh, to England and her mom is, is a federal prosecutor. So I was wondering uh, what is your origin story? We, we, uh, we, we, we like to uh, ask these kinds of early biography questions in these sessions. So. Well, I was like a kind of college student who had like didn't know how to write a resume, didn't like think about what I wanted to do with my life until like the day after I graduated. And I, I did, um, I spoke Mandarin, I like studied abroad in China. So I uh, thought I would, I don't know, I thought I, I had like studied too many things that were all like kind of useless. I was a philosophy major, no offense to anybody who was actually. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I thought, well, this journalism thing seems like a way to like make a living, not not like a real starving writer job, um, but you can also write and explore and keep learning. And so I thought I'd go to China and be a reporter there. And I did get, take a crack at that. Found that I had no idea what I was doing. So I, I came back to the U.S. to go to, to journalism school. I, um, in fact, I had sort of struggled long enough that, at getting a job that I, I thought I should go to like a specialized journalism program. I studied business journalism at NYU. And then I found that like the only kind of business journalism, that I didn't really care about business, to be totally honest, but, but you could kind of trick business magazines into hiring you if you wrote about technology, which was so like tied up with money, um, especially in the mid-2000s. You know? and, and so I, I tricked Forbes into giving me a job uh, for, for, and the, the week that I started, just by chance, um, the security writer was leaving, Lisa Lair, uh, who I think now is at the New York Times. And she was more of a national security writer, um, but being the kind of like nerd that I am, I kind of like took over that beat and made it into a cybersecurity beat. And um, I, you know, like the, when you're getting started as a journalist and you don't have any sources, and you're in j journalism school, God forbid. Like you, uh, one way to to find stories is just to kind of trawl the weird and dark parts of the internet, and that's what I've been doing as a you know that's how I got my Forbes internship and then the job. And so when I took over this security beat, like I um, that I made it that like that you know I, I kept kind of just um, seeking out those strange stories from the digital underworld, and um, at the time, like it, it's, it, it, nobody believed that that could be like your whole job as a reporter. Um, there were, you know, only a few people covering hacking full time um, back in 2006, 2007. But that, you know, but that world has just exploded, and so it d did become my full time beats pretty quickly. Um, and then, around 2010, I, I don't know, I was always like, I don't know, I've always been fascinated, in particular, with online anonymity. Um, and the ways that in this kind of digital underworld and the dark web in particular, which was really just coming to existence, coming into existence around that time, that people like hackers use in like cryptographic anonymity tools to try to hide their identities and the ways that people on the dark web were um, increasingly like using anonymity for political purposes too. And WikiLeaks ar arose around this time which was a, an experiment in using the dark web to grant anonymity to, to sources and whistleblowers and leakers of classified materials. And so I got really interested in this, in the dark web and, and, in, the, and in like the ways that online anonymity allows people to become someone else or to like show you who they truly are in, in secret. And that is really, um, 
in some sense what I've like been most focused on ever since. And that's what gave rise to this book eventually because in 2011 I came upon what seemed to me to be this new phenomenon in that world of online anonymity, uh, which was Bitcoin. And I wrote the first piece, I think the first magazine piece about, about Bitcoin for Forbes in 2011 when it was worth a dollar. And, um, and it, you know, it was, it was described to me at the time as uh, the, the, like one of the first Bitcoin developers who I interviewed, and even Satoshi Nakamoto, this c mysterious creator of Bitcoin, had described it as a potentially anonymous digital currency. Like an, uh, and it was sometimes talked about as an untraceable currency. Uh, and I was fascinated by this idea, like that you could put unmarked bills in a briefcase and send it across the internet to anybody in the world. I mean, that was right at the center of like what I was fascinated by on my beat. And so, and I imagined immediately that like this was also going to unlock a whole world of really dark stuff, like online, you know, money laundering, drug dealing, human trafficking. You know, once you can have truly untraceable payments, like Pandora's box is opened, and it truly was opened in the next years, all of that kind of came to pass. I mean, the, the dark web unlocked all of those things with cryptocurrency as its kind of monetization tool. Um, but it, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm giving you the origin story of the book as well, yeah, which yeah, is hope is okay. Yeah, it's but um, yeah. skipping ahead to, you know, <laughs> about a decade after that is, it, I finally realized, I guess, just how wrong I had been about cryptocurrency. And I think, you know, how wrong, in fact, so many of its users had been that actually, like this is the big surprise uh, of, and the big idea of this book is that Cryptocurrency, you know, turned out to be the opposite of untraceable, and that served as a trap that persisted for about a decade, you know, tricking people seeking financial privacy and, and cyber criminals in, uh, into doing all kinds of extremely subversive and, and also illegal, dangerous things on the dark web. And then, you know, uh, this small group of investigators, it turns out, was able to kind of turn the lights on suddenly. And um, you know that was just like a wonderful. Once I realized that that had happened, that I could just tell this is going to be like a crazy uh, source of drama. Just like the ability to to see people who thought that that they were invisible. You know that is going to create incredible dramatic irony. So I went kind of seeking that story. But, but the story is not over, right? The, uh, there's always this arms race, right, between those who would like to do deeds in the dark and those who are trying to figure out what it is those people are doing. And and now there are there's better encryption, right? There's there's uh, there are other more anonymous, perhaps like Monero, right? More more an anonymous currencies, and so there's the, the, the story goes on, and, and and there's this cat cat and mouse game, as you frequently describe it, right? Um, yeah, I mean the cat and mouse game is is in some ways like just getting started. You know, the the first round in some sense was um, the last decade of people thinking that they, if they were smart enough, could use Bitcoin anonymously and untraceably. And I think it's better at this point to just go by the maxim that that is impossible. That like uh, traditional cryptocurrency is extremely traceable. But then you know, in the past few years, there's been an, uh, the next stage of evolution and. We've seen tools like Monero, which you, you mentioned, but also Zcash, this like kind of the, perhaps like the most cutting edge uh, experiment in untraceable cryptocurrency come to light and get some adoption, nowhere near the amount of, you know, uh, the amount of money that's been put into these very traceable currencies. But then the, the cat and mouse game goes on in the sense that like, um, sorry, this is kind of skipping to this, some spoilers at the end of the book, but even Monero in some situations has turned out to be traceable too, it seems. Even when I can't tell how it was traced, I've seen evidence that it was traced. And even the IRS kind of, in, uh, IRS criminal investigations who are kind of the agency at the center, the, some of the protagonists of this book, uh, these sort of unlikely, you know, forensic accountants who also carry guns and arrest people. And, uh, they, in a, a case just about a year ago, um, arrested this alleged New York money laundering couple um, in, in, this, in New York City, uh, seized 
$3.6 billion worth of cryptocurrency from them, the biggest seizure of money of any kind in Department of Justice history. And if you look really closely at the documents, the court documents released with, without arrest and indictments, you can see that at one point the money is transferred into Monero and the IRS continues to, to follow the money even like after it's been uh, traded for this supposedly untraceable currency. So, you know, you can just see that like th this trap is going to, to some degree persist, that people are still going to think they're using some untraceable technology, some untraceable money, and they're using something that's in anything but, and it's going to lead investigators right to their door, just as it did for so many of these cases. So is this fun? Is, is this a fun job? Um, I mean, do, do you, I mean, is, is is this? I mean, and even when it's not fun, is is is, is it gratifying? Um, is is this? Uh, s are, are you are you really glad that you? I mean, uh, we're we're with an audience princi principally of young people who are still trying to invent themselves. Um, are, are you are you glad that you uh, invented this career for yourself? And do you have any advice for these young people who may be trying to figure things out and trying to uh, f find a path or or to uh, re recombine traditional subjects into an entirely untraditional kind of career? Wow. Well, yeah. I mean, abs like I, I would say. Writing this book was incredibly fun, <laughs> and 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 when you have a story that you are um, just so absorbed by, like a narrative, a detective story that you're telling like this, I don't know. I hope it's as fun to read it as I as as much fun as I had writing it. I mean, it is like um, it is a dream come true. It's like what you want to spend your career doing as a journalist. Um, I don't know. I have two kids, and I'm not sure I'm going to tell them to go into journalism. Not because it's it's um, not fun. It is incredibly fun when when you have the privilege to like grab onto a story like this and and like com just keep pulling those threads for. Really, I, I was doing some of this reporting for like a decade. Um, it's it's less fun when you're like thinking, what's the what's the fifth story I'm going to write this week? Like I got to come up with something uh, for my editor. So. Um, Journalism is a mixed bag, and it gets more mixed every day, you know, and, and just economically. Um, but it is, it is like, uh, I mean, if I would say, if you are, if you feel called to it, if it feels, if it, if like me, you you look at it and think like that looks like the life of kings, as H. L. Mencken would say, then you know, then go for it. Um, if you can imagine yourself doing anything. You know, more remunerative, um, more economically stable and easy, then definitely do that instead because, um, you know, it's not easy to get started. It's not easy to get the first job. It's not easy to, like, have the, the luck to come upon a story like, like this one, if I, you know, that is just that much fun to throw yourself into. And I go years and years between finding stories like this where I'm, you know, instead just kind of uh, scratching my head and berating myself that I, you know, what am I going to write that is worthy of a book? So, um, I, I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to turn it over to all of you. Um, it, it's easy to imagine you spending your life online. Um, and. Um, in the history of the institute, we've always been asking, you know, folks, you know, how, how they get themselves to, you know, c confront the uh, the blank page or the blank screen. But now, um, perhaps we should start asking authors how how they, how they disengage, how how they, how they how they disconnect from from that all-consuming vir vir virtual world. So, uh, yeah, if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, um, I remember when I started at, at Forbes.com, which was really my first job, just you know, full disclosure, I, it was Forbes.com, and then I had to work for years to get to what, what was called Forbes Magazine, you know? Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I remember I had this quota of like four stories a week, which seemed just, just Sisyphean, like I couldn't, um, uh, it was just uh, like so stressful to come up for me to come up with that many stories, and I've never had that, honestly, had that metabolism as a reporter, and it, w it felt really unnatural. Uh, and, and 
So, but you do, as a result, especially if you're covering this online world, you just plug yourself into it and just try to live in it completely. That's the only way, I think, to find like that, to keep up with the news, which moves so fast. Um, but as I've, I don't know, as I've gotten older and as I've just gotten luckier and able, as, as my editors just gave me like a slightly longer leash over the years, um, you know, I do think that what, um, it, it's just really helpful to unplug, like read a, a book in print or, or to think about instead of like, think, instead of thinking about just like the incredibly m complex and constantly evolving landscape of news, think about like the shape of a story instead and, and what kind of story you would like to tell, you know, and, um, and if you have the, the chance, like that's how I feel like I've come up with, with book ideas. It's not really by just like having my nose to the ground and shoe leather journalism and, and or, or whatever, and not like being engaged with the news always. It's about like having the space to, to take a step back, think about the shape of a story, and then like match that up with what you're seeing in the world. Great, so um, we'll call on everyone from all walks of life, but I confess that I do have a bias in favor of students or people that I think are students. So if you'd like to raise your hand and pose questions, I will tend to call on students if I, if I see them. But, uh, but non-students are welcome to pose questions as well. Yes? Um, I was reading about you interviewing the law enforcement and the criminals. Um, how did you build a trusting relationship with both parties and how different were their personalities towards you and their answers about the stories you were asking about? Yeah, you know, it's a good question because I have never been someone to tell stories from law enforcement's perspective. I mean, I, it's, I guess that that is more common for reporters um, and like to, if you're covering the crime beat, you start out um, often covering it as a police beat. But for whatever reason, I've, I've, I've just always come from like covering hackers and, and talking to that world. And, and um, I you know, interviewed the, the creator of the Silk Road in 2013, the first dark web drug market. And that was in some ways my big entr like entry in the first big story I sort of found in the dark web. And um, it was a, a, a weird shift for me to try to talk to law enforcement um, in addition to that. And um, I actually find that it's, 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 it has been much easier to get criminals to tell you their stories in that world because they are anonymous, because they are pseudonymous rather. They are hiding behind a pseudonym. They sometimes want notoriety. Um, they tell you whatever the hell they want because they can lie to you so easily. And they do lie a lot. The Dread Pirate Roberts in that interview in 2013 like lied to me in, about a lot of stuff. But then also I think, you know, like revealed a lot of things as well. And even his lies were kind of interestingly revealing in, in, in a way. Um, law enforcement, I, I've, I, I found just in, in working on this book and trying to kind of like, uh, you know, find one source that led to the next and get law enforcement agencies to open up. And I would say that the, the, the real trick was that I started with, as I said, the IRS, IRS CI, IRS criminal investigations, who are like, as one judge described to me, the redheaded stepchild of law enforcement. They get no respect from any of the, from the DEA, the FBI, like nobody even knows that, the, I mean, probably most people don't know that there is an actual law enforcement agency within IRS that carries guns, makes arrests, like extradites people from countries around the world, all of that. So they were eager to like get some attention. And um, the FBI, meanwhile, in my experience, are kind of too cool for school, do not really want to talk to you unless they feel like IRS CI is already telling the story and they want to tell their part of it. And, and so that's, that was kind of like one way um, in. Um, then you have to deal though with like the fact that they, um, they often talk like they're writing an affidavit for a, for a criminal indictment. And to get federal agents to talk about their feelings 
is very difficult and like to, to make them real characters um, took me you know more than a year of of just like hours and hours of interviews with them and asking them how they feel about things which they are just so um, unused to answering but um, but it was interesting to see that there there are like really interesting stories to tell I mean I always thought like of course the criminals have the most interesting stories to tell they are like these um, you know eccentric um, highly risk um, risk tolerance um, drug lords out there you know being like uh, doing a kind of super high risk crime that has never existed in history before but it but it turns out that I think that the detectives on the other side once you really get them to open up you know they also have incredible stories to tell and even when they don't want to tell you like the whole story if you talk to enough of the people on, on a team they kind of often haven't lined up there they haven't synced up like the parts that they don't want to tell you quite well enough that you can kind of piece it all together and even and eventually like get to those bits that maybe they wish that you didn't know so i'm going to stand at the lectern just so i have a better view um another question yes um, so since you write about hackers uh, have you ever found yourself a target of a I, I don't think I've ever um, gotten hacked because I pissed someone off. I've gotten hacked though just because like I was there, you know. And and um, like Forbes got hacked in 20, uh, 2012 or so, pretty badly. Um, like they, I think Forbes.com like lost a million people's password passwords up to their accounts in that breach. But the hackers also like. Um, defaced some pages of Forbes. They posted like a fake story, I think, and tried to trade on the financial news that they had posted. Um, and they also just defaced my page just for fun because I think that like they knew that cybersecurity people would would pick that up and, and uh, they knew who I was. And so um, like my, you know, my personal blog on the site had like written across it, hacked by the Syrian electronic army and then my face, like right next to that, which is a little embarrassing, you know. Um, but no, I, I feel lucky, and I have always been, <laughs> to be honest, like scared of far more serious kind of personal um, surveillance, uh, which, for all I know, has happened, um, or hack and leak operations that are designed to wreck my career, or, or who knows what. I mean, that was more something I worried about writing my last book, Sandworm, where I, I was, you know, trying to expose um, the most dangerous Russian state-sponsored, like, military intelligence hacking unit. Um, but I don't know, I think that ultimately they, they must have just liked the notoriety that I was bringing them, because they, they never went after me. Um, and for all I know, they, like, you know, enjoyed reading the book if they could get a Russian translation. Anyone in the back? No one in the back. I think I saw, I, saw, I thought I saw a hand up back oh, there. A hand, yeah. Okay, sir, yes. So I, get, I got the impression from your book, parts of it, that the bad guys, the folks, think that they're really the good guys, the freedom fighters, and so on. And I'm wondering what your take is on that, whether, whether the bad guys or the bad, bad guys, freedom fighters, or just business. Yeah, well, the part of the, I don't know, the, um, this book sort of begins with the, with, um, the Silk Road and when I interviewed the Dread Pirate Roberts who created the Silk Road dark web drug market, um, he was an, ide an ideological person. Like he um, told me in that interview that he, that he hadn't spent almost any of his profits from this massive drug empire that he built on, online. And that was true, it turned out. Like he really was in it for what he believed was a kind of ultra libertarian crypto anarchist revolution, you know, like take, you know, um, create, carve out a space online where the government simply cannot reach, they can't like um, control what you buy and sell and put in your bodies. I, 
I don't think I ever fully subscribed to that, but I thought it was interesting. I thought like he, I, I did see him as a political figure. He eventually tried to have people killed, it's pretty clear, to protect the Silk Road. Um, and, but I think he, even that he did out of a sense, out of kind of corrupted ideals. And the fact that, that Ross Ulbricht, who turned out to be you know, the real identity of the Dread Pirate Roberts, is now serving a life sentence without parole in prison, um, I think that that is actually uh, a, a totally unjust sentence. He didn't actually commit any violence. Was, he, the people he tried to have killed did not even ex exist, it turns out, um, for the most part. Like they were, these were just scams perpetrated against him and nobody ever, you know. So he was not a violent criminal, although he may have intended to be. Um, and really it was just uh, the fact that he had run a big drug empire that has meant that he's now already spent a decade in prison. Uh, and he actually believed that he was taking violence out of the drug trade. You know, and I, I don't think he was right about that. I mean, it, it's a complicated economic question. Like if you move the retail part of the, the, the drug trade online, perhaps you remove one place where violence happens, but there's still the wholesale part and that's maybe where more of the violence is happening and you're actually expanding the market as the judge argued in his sentencing. Um, but regardless, so the Dread Pirate Roberts, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm quite sympathetic to him, but I found his ideology really interesting. But if you flash forward a few years after the Silk Road is taken down this um, power vacuum sort of is eventually filled by a site called Alpha Bay that becomes 10 times the size of the Silk Road. Um, the kingpin in charge of Alpha Bay was this, this guy who called himself Alpha O2, turned out to be, I'm sorry, I'm spoiling all the reveals in the book, but um, this French Canadian guy living in Bangkok um, who had absolutely none of those political ideas sort of pretended to occasionally, but really was a kind of um, wannabe alpha, as you can kind of guess from the name, um, who was a misogynist, a serial, um, uh, wh wh whatever. He had like an, an, an insane number of extramarital affairs, cheated on his wife constantly, um, believed in, in this kind of like um, just crazy kind of toxic masculinity um, ideology if he had one at all. Really he was more of just a profit-seeking nihilist. And, and in, in a way, like it, um, it's just very interesting to, to watch this de-evolution of the dark web as uh, like the principled revolutionary guy is, is taken out and that just allows someone a little more cutthroat, a little more amoral to take his place. And I think that's probably still the, the path that the dark web is, is taking. Questions? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. OK, there we go. Yeah, and then we'll get back to you, too. Yeah. I'm not sure if you would label yourself as an investigative journalist, or if you would. Um, but your style of writing, would you say that you describe it as try to find the whole story and get every, get every bit and cranny, every, try to get every detail? Or would you say that you go more for the attention grabbing uh, details and circle around that? Yeah, you know, I, I don't really describe myself as an investigative journalist. I kind of do the investigation um, when I have to, to tell the story. And sometimes you do have to do all of that investigative journalism stuff, like find the anonymous sources, um, whatever, send FOIA requests and all those things. But, but I, I just am looking for the narrative, you know? And um, if somebody will just tell me that, which is, I feel like what I mostly do is I just, um, uh, as Mark said, I just like tr try to get people to open up and I just listen to them as they tell me the stories. Um, then, you know, that's, uh, it, whatever it takes, I just want to be able to tell the whole story with like, not essentially, not necessarily the most attention grabbing details, but like really um, a lot of details and really human details so that, you know, you feel like you can see it as a reader or as a writer and so that you can imagine um, 
that it's a you know like that it is a movie like in a cinematic way. Sometimes it takes a huge amount of investigative journalism to get those details. So somebody won't just tell them to you. But um, but I'm not the kind of like journalist who um, I don't know. I I actually don't find FOIA requests to be that helpful in my experience because they give you like one bare fact. Sometimes it's really newsworthy, but I'm not trying to write a news you know scoop. I'm trying to tell like a really fully fleshed out story and. And I, I really admire a lot of reporters who um, write these pieces um, without access to the sources, and they they like do um, brilliant, underhanded things to like to dig up like those pieces of information that are that nobody wants to tell you. But it's very, very difficult, I think, to write a, a um, like that full story with characters and scenes. If you don't have somebody to tell it to you, you know. So I think that the, the I always am just like looking for somebody to tell me the story. So in, in the far back, and then we'll we'll, we'll get we'll get closer. I know there were other hands, uh, but the yeah, the gentleman in the in the far corner, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Pirate Roberts you mentioned has more of an ideological motive, which is interesting because I'd always seen as hackers as being um, more you know, like profit-driven, like scammers hacking into like bank accounts and stuff. And I know you also mentioned um, uh, this like maybe state espionage is another motive, like you're talking about. Sandworm is a it's like a Russian state hacker thing. Um, would you say that? Uh, tend to like look into more hackers based on if they're like ideologically based or crime based or just whatever general like be considered movements on the dark web like Yeah, I, I, it's a really good question. I mean, um, I, w I would say hackers break down into at least like three groups. There are the state-sponsored ones who sometimes do espionage, but that doesn't interest me as much as um, when they're doing like actual cyber attacks with disruption and destruction as their focus. That's what Sandworm was really about. Like hackers, hackers doing espionage is really important, but pretty boring uh, to tell as a story. Very often, there's just like you know, it's, on one side it's people typing, on the other on a computer, and on the other side it's like information kind of invisibly being stolen. When it's cyber war, when it's a group like Sandworm, on one side it's like hackers on a laptop, and on the other side it's like the lights going out across the city, hospital medical records being destroyed, um, like you know a destructive worm causing every screen in the world's biggest shipping firm to go black, and massive container ships like arriving at terminals and nobody can figure out what's in the tens of thousands of boxes on them, you know, of, of containers. Um, like crazy huge drama. Sorry, I'm getting a little carried away talking just about one kind of hacker here, but that's the last book. The, and then, but then like, um, I've, I've never been particularly interested in just profit-seeking hackers either because usually what they do is pretty rote and boring. Um, for many years, it was just like a kind of, I would say, like a kind of almost industrial process of stealing credit cards and trying trying to monetize them. I think that's changing with ransomware, which is much more like the kind of disruptive hacking that I just described. Um, I've never I've never covered that beat. I've kind of left it to other people at Wired, truly. But I think it's fascinating and super important. Um, but but I have I don't know. I think I'm I've been most interested of all in the politically motivated hacking world. And my first book was about, really about um, WikiLeaks, which w was, you know, uh, and the ways that WikiLeaks kind of like uh, tied into a, a growing hacktivist scene, like hacker activists who were steal, like anonymous was uh, coming to light around the same time and stealing information and dumping it um, by the terabyte, you know, to try to, and sometimes just to cause chaos, because these were just kids, you know, often, but um, at least ostensibly to cause political change. And those hackers also were much more willing to talk because 
they wanted publicity around what they were doing. They wanted to like um, have political effects of their hacking. So um, yeah, I've always been interested in, in those more political hackers too. So we'll, we'll take three more questions. The gentleman in the blue mask, yes. Um, one of the things I really admired about the book was um, your, your approach to the, making the technology understandable. You seem to balance a fine line between you know, blockchain, Bitcoin, the, the forensic technologies, making them understandable and moving the narrative forward and not getting bogged down in the details. Did that come easily? Did you have to put a lot of thought and effort into that? Well, I think that, <clears throat> like, um, yeah, I, I definitely pride myself on like trying to explain technology for normal people, but it comes from being like an ignoramus myself who is a normal person, and I have to figure this stuff out myself, for myself. Um, like I, I don't sort of, I'm not a native speaker of um, this tech, these technical languages, so um, it, I don't know, it's like uh, once I've uh, understood it in a way where I can understand where it makes sense to me in an analogy or breaking it down into simple like common sense words um, you know it's easy to communicate that to the reader um, but yeah I, I do I guess like um, see my job I always have as a kind of like arbitrage like you go somewhere um, where you can find some things really complicated that the average person doesn't understand but like and then and then you spend the time as a journalist to to understand it you break it down you kind of like buy low sell high um, and just like almost like a foreign correspondent you're just like bringing um, information that's inaccessible to a to an audience so one of the things in the book that uh, I'm sure was very tough to report on was the child exploitation stuff and could you just talk a little bit about how you sort of approached covering such a tough topic and some of the ethical and just practical questions that come up trying to write about that. Yeah, um, it's definitely the, I, it's the deepest, uh, one of the first times I've covered that world. Um, I think it's a world, uh, and just to repeat the question, like this is about the, um, the child, ex child sexual exploitation case that forms a big part of the, uh, a big later part of the book. Um, the investigation of, welcome to video, the, by some measures, the biggest dark web child sexual abuse materials network ever on the dark web. Um, and yeah, I, I um, had to figure out how to write about that world. Um, you can't, as a journalist, even if you wanted to, and I do not want to, you can't legally even look at, that, at the materials, at the website. Um, so it's all about trying to like piece it together from talking to the investigators who did have the legal authority to look at the site. Um, I found that I, like, I mean, I, I learned a lot of details that I left out of the story. I remember even my, um, my agent was like, I was writing the book proposal, and he was like, take this out, take this out, nobody needs to hear this, nobody ever needs to know that fact. And a lot of them never made their way back in because, um, you know, I think that like you can leave enough of those horrors to the imagination and uh, you just can, you include a, a few of them go a long way um, to capture the reality of like how dark that part of the dark web is. But the real challenge it turns out was just, as I said before, to get federal agents who were being traumatized by this stuff. I mean, these are IRS investigators who have never looked at a child exploitation case before, but because this was that weird, rare, follow the money case that became a child exploitation case, they, for the first time in their careers, were looking at these like horrific materials and having to grapple with that. The challenge for me was actually just getting them to talk about that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, in some cases I feel like I succeeded. Um, I, I feel like I almost, you, the best I could really do with a lot of these sort of tough guys who don't talk about their feelings it's just sort of get them to admit that they were traumatized or that they themselves haven't really figured out yet what this this like dark world did to them you know they i'm not sure that they can articulate it um, but you know but uh it's enough in a, in a way to just like have to just see them 
like in an interview kind of grapple with the fact that it did change them forever and in some cases to sort of admit that like yes they you know just after a, a, a career in law enforcement seeing the worst of humanity in many cases coming to appreciate the the true nature of evil things that human beings do to each other in a way that they'd never seen before you know uh, I guess that's enough to sort of capture yeah Oh, oh, there's a student. I didn't see her. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask her after Jean Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Simple question. So there's a fellow out there named Edgar Snowden, right? Yeah. A Russian citizen. Is he a traitor or a heroic? Oh, that's a simple question. Heroic whistleblower. So is Edward Snowden uh, a traitor or a whistleblower? He's absolutely a, a whistleblower. Um, I'm not sure that, like, well, I, I would not say that. No, I would not say that Snowden is a traitor. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I like believe that what he did did not have har like costs and harms associated with it. But there's no question, I think, that he was like uh, like other people have just talked about, ideologically motivated, and wrecked his life. I mean, as he says, he like burned it to the ground because of what he believed. He had a very nice life in Hawaii. Um, it's, he, he was like, you know, rising through the ranks of the intelligence community um, and lives in paradise. And he truly risked um, spending the rest of his life in prison. And now, in fact, like, has, I, I think is suffering a pretty dark alter alternate fate, which is being trapped in Russia um, at a time when that's probably, you know, in some ways worse than ever. Um, I've, I've, in, I've interviewed Snowden a few times. Um, I admit to liking him personally. Like I, I think he's a principled guy. Um, he's also like unlike some a lot of people who have made those sacrifices or just like attained that level of fame for their, her, you know, however you see their actions. Like they're very high profile actions. He seems like relatively modest. I mean, I've interviewed Julian Assange too, and I can't say the same about him. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's, I could say a lot more. It's not a simple question, but those are a few thoughts. So, final student bonus question. So, I uh, actually had the opportunity to inter uh, interview Nico Hugh. Um, I'm a part of a podcast. He was the biggest uh, identity theft case in the United States, and I kind of ran through his life story. But to get in contact with him and everything was very hard. I, I became a friend of a friend of a friend who knew him, who got an email that didn't work, and it was a long story. How do you get in contact with these type of people? Yeah, it's funny. I do feel like a lot of hackers, they almost want to just like test you, or they're like, if you can't jump through these hoops, then that's a good sign that you're not going to understand what I'm saying anyway, or you're not worthy of telling the story. So they're like, you know, please only contact me through this encryption protocol on this like obscure web server and like also please renew your key and refresh it and tweet a hash of that key. I'm like, what? Uh, this is, you're clearly just testing me. But, um, and as I get older and you know, I'm, I'm more likely than ever to kind of be like, you know, uh, forget it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm too old for this stuff. Um, but you know, I find that like, uh, that it's uh, it's more than like a friend of a friend. I feel like that's how a lot of um, like intermediaries. That sometimes that's how this works. But in the in the dark web, you know, in the in this digital underworld, it is usually worth it to um, to I don't know, like just invest the time to understand those communication platforms. And um, I definitely have had sources say to me like, oh, like. Uh, you know, you're you're the you're not the first person who contacted me about this, but like the other guy didn't know what like a PGP private key was, and so I'm not going to talk to him, you know. So I guess it's maybe it's sometimes worth it. <laughs>